cars are often rather dull, but this one, Ford's Mustang Mach-E, very definitely isn't. The use of that famous name and the styling cues that go with it has certainly divided opinion, but it's also inspired the Blue Oval brand to give this family-sized sporting SUV a charisma its obvious rivals lack. Plus, if you go for the larger extended range battery option, you'll get yourself an EV offering a very decent all-electric driving range too. It all sounds quite promising. It's difficult to think of a much less environmentally friendly automotive model line than that of the Ford Mustang. Yet, this is the nameplate that Ford has chosen for the all-electric cars it will make in the coming era. This being the first of them, the Mustang Mach-E. This sporting SUV model is, we're told, all about fast, fun freedom, and it aims to please a whole new generation of Mustang owners. The Mach name was apparently inspired by the Mach 1 variant of the first generation Mustang and it fits with the remit given to this car's creators, Ford's Team Edison, who were tasked with creating something completely different, an aspirational electric vehicle, an EV with soul. Is that what we've got here? Well, you might wonder, uh, after all, this model's supposedly all new GE1 Global Electrified One platform is actually a revised version of the C2 chassis used in the brand's current Focus and Cougar models. But the product itself couldn't be more different from those conventional cars, as we're about to find out. Now, originally, this car was to be merely nothing more than a second-generation version of Ford's battery electric focus hatch, which would have been extremely dull. Repackaging the project based on Mustang inspiration was a masterstroke, even if it was likely to upset a few traditional followers of the iconic sports car model. Those kinds of people think Mustang means big V8 coupe, but Ford defines this sporty model line more with phrases like freedom, pioneering spirit and hint of rebellion, all characteristics that, to some extent at least, the brand claims are replicated here. But replicated in what? Ford keeps calling this an SUV. Actually, it's a roomy five-door hatch aimed at the upper end of the family EV sector, a category you could almost call mid-sized in segment, which means that for rivals, instead of Nissan Leaf or Volkswagen ID3, think Tesla Model Y, Volkswagen ID4, maybe even Jaguar I-Pace or Mercedes EQC. In concept, the Mach-E is more interesting than all those rivals. It goes further on a single charge and for claims, it will drive better too. All of these attributes will be needed to justify the aspirational asking prices and to overcome a stack of talented competitors. Can this car deliver? Car and Driving's road test, the industry's most comprehensive, will give you all the answers. So, a lot to get used to here, not only for the few Mustang devotees who will be minded to give this car a chance, but for the rest of us too. You're admitted via a weird door e-latch. And once inside, you're informed by a huge central touchscreen that initially seems a bit big, and by a letterbox-shaped full digital cluster instrument display panel that initially seems too small, displaying some wild Mustang graphics as you get comfortable. Even in the unlikely event that you started uh, without any preconceptions here, it's really hard not to have them. Click the Jaguar-like rotary dial between the seats into D, and you'll be ready to find out. The whole Mac Jet theme uh, leads you to expect the kind of frantic lunge away from rest which characterises some of this car's EV rivals. So it is slightly surprising to find a more measured level of thrust which clues you in immediately to the engineering care which has been lavished on the drive dynamics here. Uh, with some EVs, uh, the throttle is like an on-off switch. Here though, it's beautifully calibrated to better replicate a combustion power unit and a reasonably potent one too, which of course you'll need given this car's portly curb weight, which can be as much as 2.2 tonnes. 
Oh yes, combustion power units, those were the days. It seems rather quaint now remembering all the fuss that brand loyalists made back in 2015 about the availability of a four-cylinder engine and a model line previously defined by rumbling V8 Mustangs like the Mac 1, the GT390 and the GT500. Uh, going forward, Ford has decided that the pony car badge should most commonly be defined by Mustangs with no cylinders at all. Uh, this one can be had in either rear driven or all wheel drive forms. Uh, the latter version adds to the oil cooled rear axle AC electric motor with a further electric motor at the front. Either way, with the base 68 kilowatt hour standard range battery, this Ford puts out 269 PS, enough to get the rear driven version from rest to 62 in 6.9 seconds or 6.3 in the all wheel driven base model, with both variants topping out at the 111 miles an hour maximum that all mainstream Mac E's share. The bigger 88 kilowatt hour extended range battery we have here is a weightier thing of course. Uh, the battery pack alone tips the scales of 596 kilos. So Ford increases power to match uh, to 294 PS with the rear driven model which makes 62 in 7 seconds and to 351 PS with this all wheel drive variant which lowers that sprint figure to 5.8 seconds. The power plant's highest state of tune is reserved for the frantic flagship GT model which is based around the same extended range all wheel drive formula but puts out 487 PS and more torque, 860 newton meters of it than the Ford GT supercar. With the Mac E GT, 62 takes just 4.4 seconds and the top speed limiter is eased out to 124 miles an hour. So you've had the figures, what about the feeling behind the wheel? A Mustang, even an electric one, ought to have some of that. And this one does, although uh, to an extent that will be determined quite a bit by the choice that you make between the three available drive modes. Now annoyingly, you'll have to fish around to find these in this huge central touchscreen rather than simply reaching for a dashboard or a steering wheel button. Now if, as was originally intended, this design had turned out to be uh, uh, nothing more than an electric Ford Focus, then those settings would uh, undoubtedly have been called Comfort, Eco and Sport. But given the badging in play here, something a bit more evocative was called for. So instead, we've got Whisper, Active and Untamed. Now Whisper, uh, described as offering a seamless drive, calm and quiet, is good for town travel because it lightens up the steering. Uh, but you'll spend most of your time in Active and that's called Engage on US models, which Ford reckons offers a balanced drive, fun and engaging. Engaging? Well, that depends on your point of comparison. You don't throw half a tonne of batteries beneath the floor of any car and expect it to deliver a fun to drive vibe. And this one's further hobbled by a most unford like synthetic feel for the steering. Uh, despite supposedly being uh, tuned for Europe, this rack, although it is quite accurate, isn't much interested in telling you uh, a great deal about the road surface, even out of the whisper setting. And it'll take time at the wheel before you can really trust it much if you regularly tackle fast twisting back roads. Once you can though, uh, you might agree with us that this Mackey manages its mass pretty well. Uh, helped by the way that the battery pack is mounted nice and low uh, between the wheels. No, of course you can't chuck it around like a Focus ST, but there is a bit more bite to the drive dynamics than is common in this class, uh, with well bridled body control and keen grip through the turns, especially of course with an all wheel drive version like this one. Uh, dial down the traction control and you'll even be able to step the back out a bit on damper surfaces, if that's your thing of course. Uh, as a result, what's delivered here is sharper than the usual unremarkable EV handling confection. Uh, if this makes more sense, uh, then it's more Jaguar I-Pace than Audi e-tron, uh, more Mini Electric than Corsa e. And more again is promised if you switch over to the most dynamic of the three drive modes on offer, Untamed, renamed from Unbridled, which is again what it's called in the US. Uh, this setting is supposed to deliver an exhilarating drive as vehicle and road align as one. 
quotes. Uh, the exhilarating bit is presumably a reference to the sharper throttle feel, uh, the fake downshifts under braking, and to the different propulsion sound, which, as with all the models, you'll have to switch on via a virtual button below the drive setting options. Lots of trouble was taken with the untamed aural accompaniment. Uh, Ford apparently referenced the whine of Formula E race cars, and they sampled noises from Hollywood movies like Blade Runner and the Batmobile in an attempt to deliver something that has been uh, well variously described as either the rumble of a distant V8 or the uh, tumble dry program of a distant washing machine. Now we actually quite like it. Uh, the top GT version that gets a further untamed plus mode for track use. While we're talking about drive screen setting choices, we ought to brief you on an arguably more important one, Ford's one pedal drive feature, which uh, as on other rival EVs, ramps up the regenerative braking uh, to the point where you hardly ever need to actually use the brake pedal. So dramatically does the car slow off throttle. Now you can't vary the level of regeneration via steering wheel paddles or different settings in the way that you can do on some other electric rivals. It's full on iPedal drive or nothing which you'll need if you're going to get anywhere close to the driving range figures being claimed here supposedly between 273 and 379 miles depending on the drive format and the battery pack options that you select as usual we give you more detail on that in our cost of ownership section we haven't touched yet on ride quality, uh, something that in our opinion Ford usually delivers with less of a dynamic trade-off than you'll find uh, with sporting cars from any other mainstream maker. Now of course uh, the challenges were great here with all that mass to lug around and in this particular case uh, the brand has hobbled itself rather from the beginning by deciding to limit use of its Magnaride adaptive damping system exclusively to the top GT version which hardly any anyone is going to choose. The passive damping setup that all the other variants of this car have feels pretty firm at first but the multi-link rear springs cope pretty well with sharper tarmac tears and the whole setup improves enough with speed to make this car quite an accomplished highway cruiser actually. Don't expect to find the ultimate in autonomous driving tech for this kind of motoring. Uh, there's no Tesla autopilot type feature but an intelligent adaptive cruise control with lane centering and stop and go package delivers most of what you'll really need here before we all surrender that is to the concept of future motoring not being entirely dependent on the person behind the wheel. What else? Well you can tow with this car but only up to 750 kilos. Town travel is of course agreeably silent and you get a reasonable 11.6 meter turning circle. It can be hard to peer beyond the long contoured bonnet to manoeuvre the car, but it is there for a reason. Uh, well, two actually. The uh, drainable front space beneath can serve as an ice-filled beer fridge for redneck environmentalists, uh, but mainly uh, that arching hood promises that this car will, at least to some extent, deliver something of the feel of a proper Mustang. And it almost does. There's something of a rather exclusive, unusual feel to the Mach-E, which perhaps has something to do with the fact that the styling was presided over by Ford's head of design, Jason Castriota, previously at Ferrari and responsible for the Maranello maker's 599 GTB. Here his task was to translate what Ford calls its family jewels, signature Mustang aesthetic cues, into a very different kind of car. Sure enough, they all feature these muscular rear haunches, the cab rear stance, and perhaps most recognizably, these trademark tri-bar tail lamps. Although an EV doesn't need a radiator grill, Castriota and his team couldn't bring themselves to dispense with this feature entirely, hinting at it with an outline that features a slightly different blade design with an all-wheel drive model like this one. It's flanked by LED headlamps, featuring familiar Mustang angry brows, and it sits above a rather less effectively styled active lower intake. Further up, you certainly get a muscle car feel from this high, heavily contoured bonnet, even though you know that no pulsating cylinders lie beneath it.
The profile is carefully crafted too with gloss black surfacing for the roof and the lower bodywork, which you'd be able to see better without this test car's absolute black paint finish. It's all intended to give a coupe look to what is actually a large tall hatch, a car that's bigger than you think. It's priced against models like the Polestar 2 and the Volkswagen ID4, but at 4,712 millimeters in length, it's actually closer in pavement size to something much costlier like a Mercedes EQ or a Jaguar I-Pace. The arches, for some reason, are embellished with little orange reflectors, house big wheels, which vary in size, with 18-inch alloys for the standard range models, these 19-inch machined black rims for the extended range variants, and huge 20 inches for the top GT version. Various little profile cues designate this four-wheel drive variant from the rear-driven stablemate, uh, not only wheel size, but red brake calipers, and also the badge on the lower sill. Talking of badges, there aren't any Ford ones anywhere on the car, unless you count the tiny glass embossed brand references at the base and top of the windscreen and on the base of the side windows. The swept back rear end positions this model firmly as a rival to more coupe-like segment contenders like the Audi Q4 Sportback e-tron and the Nissan Ariya. Uh, there's more gloss black surfacing for the rooftop spoiler and the lower bumper and as at the front this central pony car badge designates this model's Mustang family jeans. As on the sports car there's nothing that actually says Mustang anywhere on the bodywork and nothing apart from the lack of tailpipes to indicate the EV underpinnings, uh, specifically Ford's Global Electrified One platform, and that's basically a modified version of the C2 chassis used in the Focus and the Cougar. Getting in is interesting. That's something that Ford gives you the option to do with its phone as a key technology. This uses Bluetooth to detect your phone as you approach, uh, unlocking the doors and telling the car your preferred vehicle settings and allowing you to start driving without getting your phone out of your pocket or using a key fob. Of course, there's always the possibility that your handset battery might be flat, but don't worry, as part of this car's e-latch keyless entry system, uh, they've already thought of that. A backup code can be entered into a keypad on this uh, B pillar to uh, unlock your Mac E with a separate code then necessary to start the car once you're inside. There are no conventional door handles, just this illuminated button here that you have to rather awkwardly jab at. Uh, one writer likened this to having to poke C3PO in the eye, at which point uh, the door pops open enough for you to pull it back with this rather ugly little latch. Introducing you to an interior that's nothing like anything you'll have ever previously seen on a Ford. That wasn't the original plan. The initial development intention was simply to carry over the cabin from a Focus. As it turned out, only the wheel stalks and the gear selector dial made it from that car. And what we've got instead is a rather eclectic mix of contrasting materials, uh, different design themes, and extra touches that you can't help feeling have been borrowed from elsewhere. Primarily this huge Tesla-like central touchscreen, which will seem aggressively prominent unless you've just arrived from a drive in a Model 3 or a Model Y, in which case you'll find it quite familiar. We're not completely sure it all works or that it entirely befits a car costing the amount of money that this one does. Uh, we'd take the rival Polestar 2's classier cabin any day, but having said that, uh, despite the unremitting charcoal grey theme, the American grade shiny faux leather and a rather less than solid feel, uh, we'd prefer what's on offer here to the clinicality of a Tesla, the cheap vibe offered inside a Volkswagen ID4 or the workstation ambiance of a Jaguar I-Pace. You sit quite high on flat but supportive seats, uh, peering out over this heavily contoured bonnet and squinting at the even more oddly shaped monitor that Ford has inserted behind this three-spoke steering wheel, a 10.2-inch full digital cluster, which, uh, thanks to its letterbox shape, uh, can't do much more than deliver a digital speed readout, ground speed, as Ford wants to call it here, plus also things like battery percentage, uh, remaining range, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation instructions. Still, at least you get a monitor in your line of sight, rather than having to keep glancing over to the central screen, as you would have to do in a Tesla. 
Actually, the enormous 15.5 inch display in question here is a bit different from the one favored by that American brand uh, because it features a lower physical volume dial. Now Ford says that customers specifically asked for this and given that you would have thought that the brand might have made this silver trimmed appendage of rather higher quality. It is actually just as well that this monitor is so large because the virtual ventilation buttons that surround this controller take up around about a quarter of the display space. These connect into smartly informative graphics which to some extent make up for the lack of a set of the kind of uh, more tactile physical buttons that would be easier to use without taking your eyes off the road. The screen showcases Ford's latest SYNC 4 media connectivity system, which curiously lacks the useful web browser that you get in a Tesla, but offers intuitive conversational voice recognition and claims to be able to learn your habits adapting the car accordingly. It's keen from the outset that you should insert a personalized profile to save your favorite drive and comfort settings, and perhaps more intrusively, a list of regularly visited destinations. But the idea overall is that SYNC 4 can learn this sort of stuff by itself. So if you drive home at 6 p.m. every day, expect to see that route at the top of the nav screen when you reach your Mackey uh, for that evening commute. If you like a particular podcast in your morning drive, then the car will register that and it will select it for you automatically. There are two primary screen layouts which you can select between using these rather over small buttons at the very top. Uh, you'll often be in this car section and specifically in that menu's control screen uh, because annoyingly it's the only way that you have of accessing the buttons that you'll need to vary drive modes. Uh, also propulsion sound and Ford's one pedal drive regenerative braking system. The car section also has a setting screen where you can vary all this Ford's many different functions. Uh, everything else that you'll need to access without recourse to voice control uh, that can be found by clicking this central top icons button and that delivers you to a screen which centrally displays options for the usual radio, phone, nav and Bluetooth functions plus the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, at the same time, the upper part of the monitor intuitively makes suggestions for features that it thinks you might want. And the lower part also shows a series of screen cards showing functions that you've recently accessed. Most of it works well, although sub-menu screen selections aren't always instantly delivered and the monitor itself would benefit from being slightly canted towards the driver. Uh, the DAB audio system that's built into it isn't especially impressive either if budget restricts you to the smaller battery. Uh, this extended range model though, uh, this gets a pleasingly superior 10 speaker B&O premium sound system uh, with what Ford calls a sound bar built into this fabric trim panel ahead of the front seat passenger. What else? Uh, well, time to cover off the other things you'll need to know here. Uh, these flattish seats could do with a fraction more support, but they do get standard lumbar adjustment and red stitching if you've gone for an all-wheel drive variant. Uh, the lack of the kind of touch sensitive buttons that you'll find in rivals like the ID4 or the Audi Q4 is a plus in our view. The physical steering wheel switches offered here are easy to find by feel. Is it screwed together to the standard and with the kind of quality you'd expect for the price tag? Well, that depends on how fastidiously you judge these things. Uh, the mixture of fabric, faux carbon fiber and stitched faux leather trim works quite well. Although European Mackies would benefit from the contrasting white panel, which runs across the fascia of models bound for other global markets. Build quality. Uh, from the Mexican factory is okay. Uh, that plant, by the way, already churns out more mac -E's than Ford builds proper Mustangs in Michigan. Uh, we do wonder though about this Ford's likely material longevity and software durability. We had to do a complete system reset for the central screen before we even started driving this car. 
Despite all the pony badged screen graphics, not much here reminds you in any way of a traditional Mustang. Maybe the double cowl instrument panel or the way that the huge bonnet makes judging extremities so difficult when you're maneuvering. Uh, you'll be then making frequent use of the standard parking sensors. Uh, rear three quarter vision compromises means uh, that you'll also be glad of the rear camera. And as in the Tesla Model 3, the chunky front A pillars can occasionally compromise your vision at junctions. Storage space is reasonable, although the glove box could do with being a bit bigger, as could the door bins, although they have a hidden cupboard section further back, which is quite useful. Uh, you get this deep bin between the seats here, which has a 12 volt socket, and this large area at the base of the center stack, which incorporates a wireless charging mat and also ports for both USB-A and USB-C sockets. Uh, twin cup holders sit just behind. There are ticket clips in the sun visors and Ford hasn't forgotten an overhead sunglasses compartment. Okay, time to take a look in the rear where the doors also have to be accessed via a strange little button. Once back here, as you'd hope, uh, you're treated to the first Mustang model that you needn't be a eunuch to be able to sit in the back of. Uh, and this one, in fact, a passenger of over six foot can quite comfortably sit behind a driver of the same size, helped by the fact that the roof line doesn't taper back until quite a long way in the body. Hence the rather impressive levels of headroom here for a coupe style SUV even with this fixed panoramic roof fitted, which is standard with the bigger battery. Uh, this glass top is rather impressive, by the way, not only because it's so big, but also because it has a special glass coating, which helps the interior stay cooler in summer and warmer in the winter, plus an inner layer, which uh, protects against ultraviolet rays. This bench doesn't slide and recline as it would say on a rival BMW iX3, but the absence of a prominent transmission tunnel means a third occupant would fit reasonably easily. Uh, in their absence, you can use this central armrest with its cup holders. Uh, the door bins are rather shallow and you wouldn't uh, get much in them, but this is the first car that we've come across which provides both USB-A and USB-C sockets in the back, plus there are twin vents, there are seat back pockets, and both reading lights and coat hooks in the grab handles. Let's finish with a look at boot space, which will be accessible via this powered tailgate, uh, provided you've stretched to the bigger battery model. Now we're not wildly impressed by what's delivered here. A flimsy tonneau cover positioned above the smallest trunk in the segment, rated at 402 litres. That's not much more than you'll get from a little Volkswagen ID3. Even a Tesla Model 3 saloon has more. Still, the room on offer will probably be sufficient for most owners. It's enough for seven carry-on cases, if you can lug them up to this high cargo base. And there is a bit more space beneath this height adjustable boot floor, although that is only because because Ford refuses to include any sort of spare wheel. Uh, there's a light on the right along with the 12 volt socket, plus you will get the usual pair of bag hooks and four tie down points. Disappointingly, Ford hasn't segmented the rear bench 40, 20, 40, or included the sort of ski hatch you'll get on the rival Volkswagen ID4. So you can't push long items into the cabin between rear seated folk. Uh, flatten the rear bench and up to 1,420 liters of space can be freed up. We're not quite finished yet though, because there's a further so-called frunk space beneath the bonnet. It's an 81 liter space mostly taken up with a central compartment the two main charging leads, but like the mega box in the boot of a Ford Puma, it has a drain hole at the bottom so you can easily wash muddy boots or muddy charging leads. Neat. So the clock is ticking. The UK government's decision to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2030 means that battery powered alternatives aren't an option for automakers, but a pressing necessity. Now Ford isn't exactly in the vanguard of EV development, but the company promises it will be, and that this Mach-E will be the first in a whole family of Mustang badged EVs that we'll shortly see. None of which you can expect to be especially cheap. This one certainly isn't. 
Now you would have thought that Ford's first serious EV, it isn't actually its first. There was a battery powered version of the previous generation Focus. Uh, you would have thought it would have been priced in its more affordable guises to qualify for the government's plug-in car grant. And that's applicable to electric vehicles costing under 35,000 pounds. But no, the Mustang Mach-E's starting price point is way above that from launch pitched from around 41,500 pounds. Across the range, you'll be choosing between single motor rear wheel drive and twin motor all wheel drive formats. And in either case, between two battery sizes, which we'll quote to you in terms of usable capacity. There's a 68 kilowatt hour standard range pack with 288 cells offering 115 kilowatt high powered charging or an 88 kilowatt extended range battery with 376 cells offering 150 kilowatt high powered charging, which is what we have here. Uh, the range starting price we just quoted requires you to stick with the standard range 68 kilowatt hour battery and that'll see your Mackie putting out 269 PS in both rear driven and all wheel drive forms. The latter variant requires a price premium of just over 5,000 pounds. Ideally though, you'd want to stretch to the bigger 88 kilowatt hour extended range battery pack we're trying here, which comes with a power upgrade to 294 PS for the rear driven model, and that's priced from around 50,000 pounds, or to 351 PS for this all wheel drive model, which from launch was priced at around 57,000. Now, if you're set on all wheel drive and the bigger battery pack, Ford also wants you to consider the manically fast flagship GT model, which includes both paired to a considerably higher output, 487 PS, along with more torque, 860 newton meters of it than any car the brand has ever sold in Europe. From launch, that top version cost just over 67,000 pounds. Once you've chosen your variant, you can then set to work personalizing drive settings for it, even before you take delivery. A remote vehicle setup feature available online or via the Ford Pass app allows owners to create a personalized profile to save their favored drive and comfort settings, along with the addresses of frequently visited places, home, work, and the supermarket, and so on plus the locations of nearby charging stations. You can also put in likely daily departure times and your preferred battery charge levels and then store your personalization profile in the cloud, which will mean that when you pick up the keys and first pair up your smartphone with your new Mac E, all those settings will be immediately paired with your vehicle. So no frustrating first time setups, you just get in the car and go. Okay, let's look at rivals. Now, if you viewed other sections of this film, then you'll know that Ford has ignored the market for smaller, more affordable family hatch sized EVs here. Now, yes, you can order models like Nissan's Leaf, Volkswagen's ID3, and the Skoda Enyaq IV with battery capacity to match what's on offer with standard range versions of this car. And you will probably be paying in the 35,000 pound bracket or more to do that but the contenders concerned aren't quite as large or as aspirational as a Mach-E. You would get closer to the kind of thing that's being offered here with either a Nissan Ariya, a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or a Cupra Born, all of which are priced from well under £40,000 with comparable battery packs to the standard range version of this Ford, but they're all slightly smaller cars. A couple of Teslas offer a slightly closer match. Ford's pricing, probably not coincidentally, almost identically matches what Tesla will charge for the standard range plus and long range versions of its popular Model 3, broadly comparable in power and mileage to the standard range and the extended range versions of this Ford, but the Model 3 is a saloon. For a little less, but not much less, you can get the Tesla Model Y, which is a five door hatch. For around £40,000, the Mac E starting price point, uh, you could probably get a long range large battery Model Y and perhaps even equip it with the unique in segment option of seven seats. In the 40 to 50,000 pound bracket, you could also consider premium segment contenders like the Volvo XC40 Recharge Pure Electric, the Mercedes EQA, the Kia EV6, the Audi Q4 Sportback e-tron and the Polestar 2. The Lexus UX300e also sits in that price segment, but that's not so tempting because its 54.3 kilowatt hour battery will only take you up to 186 miles. 
If you can push your budget up to around £60,000, then you could consider the BMW iX3, which has an 80 kilowatt hour battery. But if you're doing that, then you might be minded to push up towards the 65 to £70,000 bracket, and that'll get you a car like Jaguar's I Pace, Audi's e tron Sportback, and the Mercedes EQC. Those are models which aren't actually all that much larger than this Mac E. If, having considered all that, you conclude it is a Mustang Mach-E that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Ford has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Uh, the entry-level model, as we said earlier on, has a standard range 68 kilowatt hour battery and rear-wheel drive, and it comes with 18-inch five-spoke silver alloy wheels, LED reflector headlamps, LED Mustang signature tail lights, uh, powered mirrors with Mustang logo projection puddle lights, privacy glass, front and rear parking sensors, a quick clear heated windscreen, a Thatcham category one alarm, and the clever e-latch keyless entry system, which incorporates B-pillar keypad access. Ford also supplies uh, both a 6.7 meter home charging cable and a six meter high power charging cable. And all models feature three key driving modes, Whisper, Active and Untamed, along with the useful one pedal drive system, which means you'll hardly ever need to use the brake. As for core cabin features, well, the most notable one is the absolutely huge 15.5 inch central touchscreen incorporating next generation SYNC 4 media connectivity with an embedded Ford Pass Connect modem, connected navigation and natural voice search functionality. Uh, there's also wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, the sort of thing that you still can't get on a Tesla. Uh, this monitor is complemented by a 10.2 inch uh, full digital cluster that replaces the conventional instrument dials. Other key interior items include Sensico faux leather trim, which comes with grey stitching at the foot of the range, plus there's heat for the front seats and for the steering wheel, there's a rear view camera, uh, there's a wireless device charging pad and dual zone electronic air temperature control. You also get intelligent adaptive cruise control with lane centering and the stop and go feature which can bring the vehicle to a complete halt in stop start traffic and automatically pull away again. Opt to have the standard range 68 kilowatt hour battery mated to all wheel drive and Ford throws in a bit more. 19 inch black machined alloy wheels with red brake calipers, adaptive LED Mustang signature headlamps, black power folding mirrors and a blade style front grille design. Inside you get red stitching for the Sensico upholstery along with eight way power adjustable front seats and a dark headliner. If budget permits though, as we said earlier, you're probably going to want the 88 kilowatt hour extended range battery that we've been trying here. The extended range rear driven and all wheel drive versions get all the core Mac E features that we detailed on the base model, but with a few key additions, a full panorama roof, power folding mirrors, a hands-free tailgate, and an advanced active park assist system that steers you into both parallel and perpendicular spaces merely by holding down a button. Uh, inside, stretching up to the extended range battery models uh, gets you eight-way power adjustable front seats and a B&O premium sound system with 10 speakers and that includes a really smart dashboard sound bar. That leaves only the flagship GT model and that's recognizable by its special front grille, unique bumpers and 20 inch cast aluminium wheels with specially developed tires and 19 inch red calipers for the bespoke Brembo brakes. Uh, the spec here also includes unique black wheel lip moldings, GT performance seats and perhaps most significantly adaptive Magna Ride suspension and an extra untamed plus drive mode. Uh, otherwise the equipment tally is the same as that for a conventional extended range battery model. Before you go on to start thinking about options, bear in mind that if you haven't owned an EV before, you'll have to set aside some budget for a garage wall box. At the time of this test in autumn 2021, the Ford Connected wall box the brand will sell you costs around £560, with other EV box options available for either a bit more or a bit less, depending on spec. You'll also probably need to pay Ford more for your choice of colour, at least £800 more and maybe more than that because the only standard shade which comes with this car is the solid absolute black finish we have here. Beyond that you'll be choosing between three premium body colours and a further four more exclusive shades that are even pricier. 
go for the top GT and get a choice of three exclusive colors, which are unique to that variant and which come inclusive with the price of the car. Dark matter gray, grabber blue or cyber orange. Uh, with the base standard range 68 kilowatt hour rear driven model, you can also upgrade to larger 19 inch alloy wheels. All the other options are practically orientated. You can add a detachable tow bar, mud flaps and a rear ski carrier. For the boot, you can add a liner or a load compartment mat, which is reversible and folds over the bumper to protect it when you're loading. Uh, there's also a foldable transport box and a pet carrier. The extra front storage area beneath the bonnet can also be embellished with a liner. Uh, for the cabin, you can specify velour or rubber floor mats, a coat hanger, an umbrella holder, and a Garmin dash cam. What about safety kit? Well, Ford couldn't be seen to compromise here and hasn't, apart from the usual airbags and electronic assistance for braking, traction, and stability control. As you expect in this day and age, this car includes AEB, Autonomous Emergency Braking. Ford calls its system pre-collision assist, and it's one that can detect both pedestrians and cyclists. Now here, that setup incorporates forward collision warning and collision mitigation, plus dynamic brake support for swifter stopping, and a distance alert indicator that warns if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. There's also lane departure warning to alert you to drifting out of lane, at which point a lane keeping system applies subtle steering lock to ease you back to where you ought to be. Uh, this is somewhat overzealous in the way it operates, so it's just as well that you can easily turn it off without having to delve down into the infotainment screen submenus. There's a simple button to do that on the wheel. As you expect, uh, there is also speed limit assist, and that helps you to keep your license in built-up areas, and auto hold, which will stop you from drifting backwards when you're starting off from uphill junctions and inclines. Ford additionally provides evasive steering assist to help in emergency maneuvers, a BLIS, blind spot information system, which stops you from dangerously pulling out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot, and cross traffic alert, and that warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a parking space. Uh, there's driver alert two, which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness, which, if it's detected, will earn you an admonition to stop for a restorative coffee plus wrong way alert, which stops you from entering a one-way road the wrong way, and reverse braking assist too, which uh, mitigates collisions at parking speeds uh, by braking the car automatically, say, to avoid a low wall, or more seriously, a child or a pet. Talking of children, we like the fact that this car incorporates a rear occupancy alert system, which reminds drivers to check the rear seats when they're exiting the vehicle with a message on the dash. Believe it or not, tragedies regularly occur where children have been accidentally locked in the car. Uh, horrifically, in the US alone, more than 800 children have died from heat-related illnesses in vehicles since 1994. And in 55% of those cases, the parent was apparently unaware that the child was even in the vehicle. On a really hot day, experts say it only takes a matter of minutes before the heat can overwhelm a child's ability to regulate his or her internal temperature. Their core temperature uh, can increase three to five times faster than that of an adult. At the end of the 90s, the US Navy had a recruitment ad that read, uh, the Beach Boys, Apple Pie, the 67 Mustang, three things worth fighting for. Uh, this modern Stang fights for something a bit different, the social credibility of EV motoring. Now, folks who will consider one will often be people who would previously have seen EVs as vehicles better suited to others, but Ford's marketing is based around this being the kind of car that you might want to consider even if being part of the whole global emission solution isn't top of your life priorities. Given the awful state of our country's public charging infrastructure though, this car isn't going to get a Away from first base in the showroom stakes unless it can offer credible driving range figures. Sounds obvious, well it isn't to every brand in this segment. Fortunately though, Ford hasn't traded sensibility for style here and the range figures that we've been quoting throughout this test are actually reasonably class competitive. 
We've briefed you on the two battery sizes on offer, the standard range 68 kilowatt hour unit, uh, total capacity 75 kilowatt hours, which has a WLTP rated range prediction of up to 273 miles in a rear driven form or 248 miles with all wheel drive. To give you some class perspective on that, a rear-driven Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus delivers 278 miles, so Ford is definitely in the ballpark. But it's also worth pointing out that for not much more than Ford wants for a Standard Range Mach-E, uh, you can get a 77 kilowatt hour spec Volkswagen ID.4 with a 310 mile range. Go for this Ford with the larger extended range, 88 kilowatt hour battery, total capacity uh, 98 kilowatt hours, and the figure rises to 379 miles with a rear driven Mach-E, uh, which from a drive perspective would be your variant of choice. Uh, the extra weight of all wheel drive drops drive mileage to 336 miles with the 88 kilowatt hour extended range battery model we have here. Again, to give you some class perspective, a rival Tesla Model 3 long range all wheel drive model manages 360 miles. If we had chosen to test the 88 kilowatt hour version of this Ford in its top high output Mac E GT form, we'd have been looking at a range of 310 miles. The official figures, of course, are all very well, but what kind of real-world mileage can you expect from this car? Well, on the basis of our testing, an average of around 220 miles is the kind of figure you'll get from the standard range 68 kilowatt hour Mach-E. Think around 260 to 300 real-world miles from an extended range 88 kilowatt hour model like this one. On this test, we've averaged around three miles per kilowatt hour, although only when we've made regular use of the one pedal drive function for increased regenerative braking and when we've resisted the temptation to activate the untamed drive mode of course. A brake coach feature can uh, by the way display a screen message indicating the amount of energy you've recovered while you were braking in your journey and you can set a low battery warning at either 20, 30 or 50 miles to suit your expected level of range anxiety. What about charging? Well, all EVs come with a public charge cable, but unlike some other brands, Ford doesn't make you pay more for an additional one that can be plugged into a domestic socket. Uh, the car also comes with an 11 kilowatt onboard AC charger. You'll need to bear in mind that the larger 88 kilowatt hour battery obviously takes longer to replenish its cells, but potentially it can charge faster, providing you're fortunate enough to find a really rapid public charger. For use of that though, uh, you'll need to have bought the uh, more expensive model, whereas the 68 kilowatt hour standard range unit offers DC charging at up to 115 kilowatts, the 88 kilowatt hour extended range battery can DC charge at up to 150 kilowatts, and that opens up access to the new generation of rapid chargers, currently rarer than hen's teeth of course. Ford is a founder member of the Ionity network, which has around 400 of those DC high power 150 kilowatt chargers at different points around Europe. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to find one of those with an 88 kilowatt hour Mackie, it'd be possible to add an average of 61 miles of driving range for every 10 minutes of charging and charge from 10 to 80% battery capacity in just 45 minutes. It'd be 38 minutes with the standard range battery. But let's get back to the real charging world that, as an owner of this car, you'd be living in right at present. Uh, with both models, the kind of public 50 kilowatt CCS charger that you're more likely to find will take the battery from 10% to 80% capacity in around 90 minutes or around 40 minutes with a 100 kilowatt charger. At the time of this test, Ford was offering five years of free access to the Ford Pass charging network, which covers around 70% of charging stations, with around 15,000 charging points in the UK and over 200,000 across 21 European countries, uh, plus uh, also a year of access to the Ionity fast charging network which all sounds pretty impressive, but still isn't enough to match the proliferation and flexibility of the supercharging network that you'll get access to with a rival Tesla Model 3 or Model Y. Still, what's on offer here should be enough to offer a reasonable number of journeying options, and that'll be helped by the way that this Ford's connected navigation system identifies up-to-date public charging locations as you drive and prompts you to charge at the most convenient points on each trip. Fortunately, electric vehicle owners do 80% of their charging at home. 
uh, for home charging because charging from an ordinary three pin socket is obviously pretty slow think around nine miles per charging hour and 22 hours for total battery replenishment from empty uh, the brand hopes to sell you its Ford connected wall box offered in 7.4 kilowatt and 11 kilowatt forms at the time of this test in autumn 2021 Ford was asking 789 pounds including VAT for the 7.4 kilowatt version of the wall box uh, that price includes a 350 pound government grant from the EV home charge scheme uh, the Ford connected wall box offers up to five times the charging power of a typical domestic socket and it can top up the battery from 10 to 80 percent in around six hours a full charge from 0 to 100 percent will take more like 11 hours with a standard range model or around 14 hours with the extended range mac e Based on an average cost of kilowatt hour energy at 16.3 pence, uh, fully charging this Ford from your garage will typically cost around 12 pounds 20. Using the central screen's car menu and then selecting the charge section from settings, you can visit a battery status section which will allow you to schedule charging in line with cheaper off-peak electricity tariffs. Uh, plus you can use a departure and comfort screen to preset the climate system temperature so you don't have to waste energy with ventilation fan use, uh, warming or cooling the interior once you're ready to go. All of this can be done remotely via the Ford Pass app. Uh, the icons part of the central touchscreen also has a trip section which shows you your most recent journey in miles, minutes and miles per kilowatt hour. Uh, while also answering the question, where did my energy go? Uh, displaying that in percentage terms in climate use, uh, power, accessories and the extent of the effect of exterior temperature. Now the same screen also rates the efficiency of your driving in terms of uh, acceleration, deceleration and speed. What else might you need to know? Uh, well, any warm fuzzy feelings about saving the planet by choosing an EV like this one need to be tempered slightly. Uh, the power to charge this car up has to come from somewhere after all. And if you take uh, power station output into account, then this isn't a zero emissions vehicle at all. Its well to wheels CO2 figure is about 36 grams per kilometre. You also need to consider the fact that a battery pack with the energy equivalent of 25,000 little AA batteries, as is the case with this top car's 88 kilowatt hour unit, can't just disappear at the end of their life cycles. With technology as it is at present, automotive EV batteries are going to end up in landfills at the end of their working lives, and that's about as far from being green friendly as it's possible to get. Now, solutions to this are, of course, gradually appearing, but whether they'll be sufficient to deal with the glut of EV batteries which is likely to descend on scrapyards in a couple of decades time is really questionable. Right, a few more final cost of ownership details. Like all EVs, this Mac E is exempt from road tax and business users will benefit from a 1% benefit in kind taxation rate, which at the time of this test meant a 40% taxpayer would get a BIK bill of £165 for the 2021 to 2022 tax year, massively less than you'd have to find for a comparable combustion model. As for insurance premiums, well, the standard range model starts at Group 33E. Uh, the figure moves up to Group 37E for a standard range all-wheel drive or an extended range rear-driven model. It's Group 40E for this extended range all-wheel drive version. All of that is quite a jump from the figures which apply to a PHEV plug-in hybrid. A Ford Cougar PHEV, for example, is rated at Group 21 but the Mackey looks affordable to insure compared to a rival Tesla Model 3. Uh, that car is rated up at Group 48. Moving on to residual values, expect this Mac E to retain 52.7% of its original value after three years ownership. Uh, that's according to CAP. Other experts have published predictions up to 56%. By comparison, a Tesla Model 3 would retain 59 to 63% uh, over the same period, much the same as you get from a Polestar 2. This Mustang comes with the usual Ford three-year 60,000 mile warranty and a year of roadside assistance. Uh, you could pay more to extend the cover to either five years and 100,000 miles or eight years and 100,000 miles. Uh, the mach battery is protected by a separate eight-year 100,000 mile warranty. 
What about servicing? Well, this car requires a garage visit every two years or every 18,000 miles, whichever comes first. A Mackey driver will enjoy lower maintenance costs than would be needed for a combustion model, of course. Uh, obviously, no oil changes are required and regenerative braking uh, means that the brake pads are designed to last the life of the car. Most owners will want to take out the Ford Protect Service Plan Plus program, which allows customers to spread the cost of routine maintenance. Uh, this service plan also includes extended roadside assistance, and that includes rescue charging and technical help should you need it for your home wall box. So, there you have it, the car that bridges the gap between Ford's past and its future. Far from killing off the traditional Mustang sports car, this EV will extend that model's life, driving down Ford's across the range emissions and making continued production of that classic sports car justifiable. It's really difficult to understand why the traditionalists who moan about use of the Mustang name here can't see that. As for the Mackie itself, well, we like the way it's refreshingly different from anything else in the segment, not only due to the name and the bodywork, but also because of all the unusual little touches. The e-latch door system, uh, the ground speed instrument readings, the weird drive mode names. It's also got a bit of pavement presence too, plus a very clever infotainment system. And perhaps most importantly, it trumps many of its rivals when it comes to driving range. Not everything is great, of course. The interior fittings don't really match up to the asking price. The steering could do with a bit more feel and the ride can feel quite firm at low speeds. Uh, the handling battles a bit with all that weight too, although we would agree that this Ford is a fraction more engaging to drive than most of its direct rivals. Overall, it is collectively enough just about to propel this car into class leadership, provided that you can afford those aspirational asking prices and that you're not too hung up on the thought of premium cabin quality or a posh badge with an EV of this size. At the first ever Detroit Auto Show, Henry Ford said he was working on something that would strike like forked lightning. That was a Model T. With the Mustang Mach-E, Ford aims once again to strike like forked lightning, this time with a more interesting, charismatic interpretation of what a family-sized full electric car can be. The coming years will bring us dozens of new electric vehicles, but most will be sensible, worthy and rather boring. This car and the various electrified Mustang models that will follow it offers something more appealing and charismatic in a way that we think may well strike a real customer chord, just perhaps as the original Mustang sports car did way back in the 60s. Who says that lightning doesn't strike twice?